The agenda for today, my name is Tristano, I'm the Marketing Manager of the Cloud Credential Council and for the webinar of this month, I have the pleasure to have here with me Scott Manjot, the Senior Business Analytics Solution Manager at SAS, uh, expert in Big Data Analytics. For the webinar of this month that is Living in the Cloud, Big Data Analytics and Enterprise Cloud Computing. Let's start with a quick presentation of the Cloud Credential Council. So, the Cloud Credential Council is an independent and vendor neutral uh, organization. It's based in California, Palo Alto, with membership that includes user organization, vendors, professional association, and international certification bodies. The CCC has developed a professional certification program for cloud on top of the Cloud Essential Certification. Organizations like Microsoft, IBM, HP, Dell, and more have then participated in designing and development of the full program. So far, uh, we can say that it's a global not-for-profit organization with more than 300 members increasing. So, a little bit of history of the CCC. CCC started in 2010 when a bank, ING, decided to consolidate data centers and adopt cloud. And um, they realized that it was necessary to create a, a specific training for all the employees. From there, uh, the CCC has collected some cloud experts that work at, for example, VMware, Cisco, IBM, HP, and they contribute to course and exam development. So at that point, Cloud Essential first and then Virtualization Essential was created. Then the development went on and on and uh, advanced course were started with input from cloud experts that work at leading cloud computing companies like for example HP or Cisco. And they moved forward and they created all the professional series for all the job roles that we have individuated, like administrator, developer, and so on. Recently, very big company like Citrix and the Interpol have used the CCC to develop specific training or to uh, adopt it internally. So the certification schemes of the CCC is composed by an associate level that has a Cloud Technology Associate and the Big Data Foundation certification and those are recommendation for who are interested in then taking professional cloud administrator, developer, security manager, service manager and solution architect. The accreditation scheme it's important because in order to get accredited uh, you have to understand that it's necessary to follow the CCC accreditation scheme. Training must be organized by CCC accredited training partner and delivered by CCC accredited trainers using CCC accredited course material. This provides a standard of quality at all levels. So training partners are assessed directly by us, by the CCC, and all the trainers must bring proof of experience and need to pass the exam with high grades. So, and the last check is that the CCC courseware has to be uh, created directly by us. Okay, so I will now give the voice and the control to Scott that is going to run the next presentation. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll get started here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, big data analytics and enterprise cloud computing. Um, and, uh, well, it's a very... Uh, detailed topic, uh, we could easily spend several hours. Um, so my intention really is to uh, give a, a, an overview. I've seen that a number of you come from training and consulting and have uh, uh, some cloud experience and uh, a little less analytics experience. So I'll uh, just cover the, the basics of cloud and uh, go into a little more detail about um, cloud analytics. Uh, and one way to do this is, is to address the, the why, the what, the, the how, and the who. Um, and before I get started, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I've been working with computers for almost 30 years now. Um, and uh, 
uh, mostly in data intensive roles and consulting uh, uh, and uh, solutions development ro roles. Um, my current role is at SAS. I'm based between London and Amsterdam and uh, I'm a senior business solutions manager. So uh, I travel around Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, um, and uh, uh, produce solutions using the SaaS platform. Uh, I also have experience at Deloitte, and I see that uh, Microsoft, Intel, and Cisco are, are part of the Cloud cred Credential Consortium, and that uh, I have a number of, of um, uh, colleagues who work in those organizations. So if you, if you like today's presentation, uh, and because we only have a short time together, um, there are a number of other presentations I've given at universities and at conferences on YouTube. So if you put my name into YouTube, um, there are some more detailed presentations on the topics of analytics uh, and, and on specialty areas such as uh, cognitive analytics. So. Um, to get started, um, well, I won't spend too much time uh, uh, talking about how, how good uh, SaaS is, uh, but I will just mention that SaaS is the market leader in analytics, uh, software, and solutions. Um, and uh, as uh, I've had exposure to, to the technologies we're going to talk about today, and, and uh, SaaS indeed uh, uh, is very involved in cloud-based analytics. Uh, so uh, the the topic uh, has many detailed uh, specific areas, which is data analytics. We could we could easily talk for a full day about uh, uh, text analytics, for instance. But uh, in order to to focus our summary, I'll just take the general uh, uh, structure of talking about cloud analytics in terms of technologies, uh, processes. Peop and people, and, and by that I mean data engineering, data analysis, and uh, decision making in organizations. So, in other words, to explain the 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 what, the how, and the who of cloud-based analytics. Uh, but to, to get started, I'll just perhaps start with the why, which is the business uh, level question about why we would want to uh, implement or pursue uh, big data cloud analytics. And uh, really, it's perhaps a bit of a no-brainer, which is just the sheer explosion of data we're experiencing in today's world. And uh, this is sort of a uh, what could be called a uh, virtuous cycle of many of the new technologies surrounding big data, which are uh, mobile platforms, web-based platforms, data analysis systems, real-time systems. These are uh, both consumers of big data and producers of, of big data, which is that uh, almost in a cycle, we're seeing uh, more and more data being generated by the very systems that run off of big data, and, and that this data is increasing in uh, volume, uh, which is the sheer amount of data, the velocity, how quickly it's, it's coming at us, uh, the variety of data types, and, and the complexity. So you may have seen, for instance, this interesting representation of what's happening in terms of data online in 60 seconds. And uh, um, you know, this is just a representation of some of the more popular uh, and known systems or, or services available on the web. But uh, if we just think about how many tweets, uh, YouTube videos, uh, Gmails, or Amazon transactions, are occurring every second. It's truly remarkable. Uh, so this is all data that's being generated, generated and stored in systems. Uh, uh, we're also seeing that there is increasingly the growth of uh, cognitive computing, such as IBM's Watson, uh, uh, which is also known known under the rubric of artificial intelligence. Although, although that banner, I think, has somewhat come under criticism, but uh, there are increasingly uh, uh, we're seeing systems themselves uh, operating, uh, making judgments on, and generating data themselves, uh, uh, such that uh, we have the uh, ability of expert systems uh, to consume and produce data. Additionally, we're all aware of the uh, so-called Internet of Things, which is uh, active uh, smart devices that also both uh, consume data and generate data uh, through sensors and communicate amongst themselves and then also uh, with, with people. 
So uh, as a result of all of this, we've heard of uh, what has been termed the uh, sexiest job of the 21st century, the, the data scientist. And there's been this uh, outcry that we need more data scientists. So uh, today we'll, we will talk about um, what is the skill set of a data scientist uh, uh, in a little bit of detail. Um, but uh, I think it's appropriate just to remark uh, from the engineering standpoint that a lot of this is happening because of uh, what's called Moore's Law, which is the notion that roughly every 18 months computing processing power uh, doubles. And, and so this holds true uh, throughout my career, which is that uh, since working with computers in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, we've seen uh, computing grow in power from, from uh, home computers to high capacity servers in the 90s to the smartphone explosion in, in 2000 and uh, now increasingly as I've covered uh, the growth of cloud computing, AI or cognitive computing and Internet of Things uh, such that uh, even the cell phones we're carrying in our pockets now are a good 25,000 times more powerful than the, the PCs that I was using in the uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s. Um, so in, in addition to this, uh, what we're seeing then is a desire to link computing resources together uh, in terms of uh, uh, server clusters uh, to provide uh, massive uh, cloud-based services through uh, the internet. And this is a very rapidly growing market. It's, it's not uh, what I would call a uh, hype or a trend. It just simply is a, a huge market and it's projected to be upwards of uh, 107 billion US dollars in 2017. Uh, it's a market that's growing at about uh, 20, over 23% uh, annual growth rate, uh, which is quite remarkable uh, compared to the to other ICT industry uh, uh, areas which are grow, grow at about 5%. So, so this is quite remarkable and um, uh, we will talk in detail about analytics but uh, because I know some of you have a little less background in cloud computing, we'll just uh, briefly cover the basics in order to provide, to provide a foundation. So, so what we're talking about is the technology and uh, the stock definition from the M NIST is that cloud computing encompasses uh, on-demand network access to uh, configurable computing resources that can be rapidly uh, provisioned and they cite uh, three service models and four types of deployment models which I'll briefly cover. I know some of you have already seen this uh, but if we think about uh, computing infrastructure as a set of layers that uh, that uh, start with just the core infrastructure, uh, which, are, which are servers and storage and networking resources. On top of that, we have tools and utilities such as databases. And then on top of that are built applications and software that solve and automate uh, business problems. So uh, similarly with cloud computing, uh, cloud computing addresses each of these layers. So there's the term uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and, and software as a service. So uh, as, as a result, uh, uh, there are cloud computing resources and services and companies that uh, provide uh, combinations or focus in one uh, of these areas. Uh, and, and so to give a little more detail, uh, uh, the example of the infrastructure of, as a service is uh, it covers virtual machines and servers, whereas uh, platform as a service covers uh, uh, you know, web, service, web servers, databases, development tools, and software as a service is, is complete solutions such as uh, customer relationship management, for example, salesforce.com, or email such as uh, Gmail and Hotmail. Uh, uh, virtual desktops and then um, massive multiplayer games. Uh, typically uh, users then connect to these services, uh, the web browser being a very popular uh, method to connect to cloud services, uh, but you know people can also collect, uh, connect through mobile uh, thin clients or term terminals. So uh, when we talk about analytics, which is the main subject, uh, we uh, this is this is my own term. Uh, it seemed uh, I call it data analytics as a service, DAS, 
I suppose, uh, which sounds better than AS, which would be analytics as a service. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, w this encompasses all layers of the infrastructure, uh, which is that uh, when we talk about analytics uh, uh, from the infrastructure layer, we're talking about uh, massive storage, uh, virtual machines, uh, load balancing, a distributed processing. When we talk about uh, platform, we're talking about uh, providing Hadoop clusters, uh, uh, data warehousing, uh, machine learning tools, dashboarding, and when we talk about SA uh, SaaS or uh, software as a service, we're talking about uh, packaged uh, approaches to analytics such as pre-configured dashboards, uh, uh, guided data analysis, self-service analytics, expert systems, and now even uh, perhaps we could consider cognitive computing in that uh, territory because cognitive computing um, accesses and uh, operates using large uh, s uh, sets of data. So the uh, the deployment models uh, for the cloud uh, then are a span from uh, private or internal clouds which some companies choose to deploy uh, to reserved uh, uh, clouds that run uh, outside of the traditional uh, organization or server farm in, in uh, uh, remote locations, uh, but which are secured, and then public resources, uh, uh, which can also be secured or securely accessed. Um, and uh, it's worthy to say that SaaS uh, addresses all of these. We provide solutions in all of these deployment areas. Uh, so uh, we have solutions uh, running, we have, are running over 500 systems on, in 73 countries uh, for more than 250 customers. And uh, since security, especially in the public cloud, is such an issue, uh, uh, SaaS puts a lot of time and effort into maintaining uh, and substantiating credentials that we are compliant with, with uh, uh, the highest standards of security when offering uh, public cloud services. So on that point, uh, perhaps one last uh, 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 item to raise is that there's been some talk in the tech industry blogs about, uh, well, where is uh, public versus private cloud going and uh, uh, so for instance in Tech Republic there was uh, a recent article that says that although public cloud or pri private clouds are growing which is private clouds are being um, uh, companies that choose to uh, configure their own uh, clusters on site at their in their own facilities um, is not growing as quickly as public cloud um, and it's only about six percent of the overall um, cloud computing market so there is uh, some critique that perhaps uh, private clouds are something that is uh, will eventually go away uh, because uh, the motivations between having a private cloud, uh, the motivations for having a, a private cloud often are about control, which is the idea that if you can touch the servers and they're somehow in your building, that uh, they're secure. Um, and this may even be a generational issue uh, because uh, increasingly uh, we're seeing that the public cloud infrastructure has very high services uh, related to encryption and uh, uh, related to uh, securing connections such that uh, it, it may even be the case that a computer sitting next to one's desk is, is uh, infested with uh, a botnet infection and that there are hackers from many different countries you know serving uh, you know serving uh, pornography off that computer whereas in the cloud it, it's uh, being maintained by uh, expert uh, engineers and uh, uh, who, are, who are up on the very latest security standards. So it's worthy perhaps to know that um, that the private cloud uh, is maybe something that will go away eventually as people gain more comfort with the notion of storing their data remotely and accessing it remotely. So who are the uh, big cloud vendors? Well, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft are the two uh, undisputed leaders. Um, and uh, this is the Gartner Magic Quadrant for 2015 on uh, uh, cloud, public cloud storage services. Uh, but we also have the involvement of, of some of the other big majors. So we have uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, Oracle, uh, HP, and IBM uh, all participating. 
and uh, they provide uh, not only uh, uh, um, server-based uh, uh, resources, but uh, which is processing, but they offer storage, so uh, the ability to configure relational and non-relational databases, but also to instantiate uh, Hadoop clusters. So I've worked with, for instance, Amazon Web Services, and it's a very straightforward uh, service, and it's fast growing. If you saw the latest Amazon uh, revenue numbers, um, and basically you can requisition uh, several hundred servers and set up a massive uh, Hadoop uh, data cluster um, uh, in, a, in a, the matter of, of a, an hour and, and be operating and analyzing huge uh, sets of you know, terabytes of data. Uh, and so that's quite exciting uh, where, where, where we are now in terms of the uh, availability of cloud-based uh, resources. So, uh, and, uh, to, to, to address the topic of how our clouds uh, and cloud computing, uh, how is it used, uh, I'll refer to a Deloitte report. I, uh, I worked uh, for Deloitte uh, formerly, and um, um, uh, I have links to those reports that I'm citing through the presentation, and we'll share the presentation with you later. But uh, uh, they have pointed out, I believe this survey was, was of uh, 10,000 organizations uh, at a global level, and they pointed out that 42% uh, of these companies say that they're currently deploying cloud solutions, and 21% uh, 20, <clears throat> have reported uh, mature, successful deployments. Um, so the, the major areas where cloud computing is, is applied include financials and accounting, CRM, customer relationship management, Salesforce automation, uh, supply chain management, and then data warehousing and analytics. Um, and perhaps the analytics part is a bit understated from the perspective that um, each of the other areas also have reporting and analysis components typically embedded in them. So to some extent, um, all of the areas that, uh, uh, that are, are applied, that it, where cloud computing is applied, um, use some type of analytics. So uh, that brings us to uh, data analytics itself. Uh, so this area uh, here may be of interest from the perspective that um, uh, uh, citing the same report from, from Deloitte, um, Deloitte breaks down the trends associated with analytics, uh, which are that analytics, uh, according to the survey, uh, is applied to influence, uh, to address strategy, uh, to provide uh, metrics to support business decisions, to support forecasting, and to, uh, to conduct predictive behavioral analysis, for instance, uh, to conduct customer analytics. And uh, that Deloitte had also recognized that 80% of the respondents uh, uh, are using business analytics intensively uh, compared to 65% last year. So it's a, a very fast growing area, data analytics. Uh, so in terms of uh, addressing what is data analytics, I think a very simple way to describe it is to consider that uh, data analytics addresses uh, what happened, which is to describe the past, uh, what are trends, which is to predict the future, and then what to do, which is to optimize systems. And uh, from a historical perspective, uh, these come to us from the fields of business intelligence, uh, econometrics, forecasting and machine learning, and operations management. And each of these areas uh, are substantial uh, uh, areas themselves, which is you can even get a degree in each of these areas at the university. And analytics can be considered as a practitioner field that combines uh, best practices and approaches uh, from each of those domains uh, to produce solutions and to guide business decision making. So, uh, you know, it's very easy to, um, uh, uh, to go into detail and to start confusing people about analytics. And I do feel that uh, some people are quick to jump into mathematical uh, formulas and algorithms. But uh, what I'll do is give you a quick overview of what of analytics techniques. Uh, so you can just understand that, in essence, they are somewhat simple, which is that um, analytics can be applied to explore uh, uh, large sets of data in order to identify patterns. 
Um, so one of the techniques applied is cluster analysis. So the cluster analysis is simply looking at uh, uh, self-similar groupings in large sets of data. So if we think about a set of, of data about customers, um, for, for instance, for a bank, we might be interested to identify um, uh, how our different uh, customers uh, pay their mortgages, that some are, are, are uh, uh, struggling with mortgage payments, uh, some may uh, are doing very well and have an appetite for new products, um, uh, and others may be looking for, for instance, home improvement loans. And so what we can do with cluster analysis is we can use statistical analysis to identify self-similar groupings in sets of data that may not have been apparent uh, from the business experts. So it's a statistical technique that validates and identifies self-similar groups in large sets of data. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, we can apply uh, another type of exploratory technique, which is uh, linear analysis, which is to separate uh, groups according to some criteria. Uh, so we can uh, separate uh, customers according to uh, uh, their ability to pay versus customers who look like they may default on a loan, for instance. And so this uh, may apply, for instance, uh, regression analysis to, uh, to uh, identify these self-similar groups. So uh, as well, um, linear analysis can help us to look at trends and patterns over time. So regression analysis can help us to um, chart, for instance, the movement of stock or commodity prices or property prices over time. And once we've identified a trend, we can use that to project into the future and to make predictions. So, uh, of course, this is of, of interest to businesses who want to uh, make decisions about the future movement of, of prices or dynamics. And so uh, we can use analytics to try to predict. Uh, predictive analytics can also help us uh, to identify patterns and to identify anomalies. So um, I have done several projects in the area of fraud analytics and one of the uh, uh, key methods in fraud analytics is to identify outliers or, or people who are uh, doing uh, unusual things compared to the, the major trends in order to investigate whether fraud may be occurring. So the ability to uh, use computer algorithms to identify trends and, and self-similar groupings and also to forecast can help us also to identify potential violations or anomalies that, that require further attention. Uh, so uh, it's also appropriate to say that a particular observation uh, may be anomalous with reference to a context or condition and that analytics can help us to identify these conditions to better understand phenomenon. So if we look at, for instance, buying behavior in uh, customers, we may see that uh, there's a seasonal variation, that they may buy our products um, in certain times of the year and we may use that information to try to optimize our supply chain, for instance, or to prepare for larger volumes of purchasing. So th those are, uh, I think, uh, covers quite a bit of some of the fancy techniques that fall under <laughs> the, the uh, banner of analytics. And uh, uh, you know, I do think that people can quickly um, talk in a very complicated way about analytics, but when you think of it at a high level, it's about identifying patterns where we have not seen them before using statistical techniques, or about uh, um, classifying uh, particular groups into one group or another, uh, or about predicting uh, where a new instance will fall into one group or another, and then uh, potentially also to optimize these systems uh, uh, based on our understanding of phenomenon. So uh, just to uh, summarize then, if uh, just thinking of a very simple example, if we have an ice cream shop that uh, uh, is run using advanced analytics uh, when we talk about descriptive analytics, we would, uh, we would be able to analyze purchasing behavior to understand what were the most preferred flavors. We could use forecasting to try to uh, predict how much uh, of particular types of ice cream would be purchased in the future based on our, the dominant trends. 
we could use uh, uh, predictive analytics also to identify which customers are more likely to buy, for instance, vanilla ice cream. And then we can use optimization to uh, uh, to try to understand uh, how much supplies we need to order in order to meet customer demand uh, and to optimize our resources given the predictions that we've made about purchasing behavior. In addition, uh, there are other types of analytics such as text analytics where we can uh, use some of the same techniques to analyze unstructured text, for instance, uh, to look over uh, customer complaints or tweets to uh, extract out patterns or trends in text. Um, we can also use visualization so we can uh, use advanced methods to visualize uh, statistics and dashboards and this is particularly useful for um, non-technical users who may want to play with the data or to explore the data to gain new insights. And finally, uh, and this is typically somewhat of a unpopular topic, uh, but it is crucial, which is we can't have any of this without data quality. And a lot of my projects start uh, with the uh, effort to try to um, analyze uh, and to address data quality. And there's a lot of companies that suffer from poor data quality. So it's, it's perhaps very worthy to mention that data quality is, is a very important element to all of this. Okay, so um, I, I know that uh, a number of you are consultants and or trainers, and so um, I'd like to address the topic of data analytics skills. What, what exactly, uh, what, what is the skill set of, of a data analytics expert or a data scientist? Uh, well, it's really a combination of factors. Uh, so, so we can say that it's typically hacking or computer skills mixed with math and statistics knowledge and then uh, typically some focused expertise in a particular area. Uh, so that, that could be on uh, uh, finance or, or it could be in uh, retailing uh, or it could be in uh, customer analysis. And um, so around this then we have skills that include uh, a, you know, uh, the math and statistics but also advanced computing, uh, domain expertise and data engineering. And uh, it's appropriate that this is a very broad set of skills. Uh, so, so you can, of course, get a PhD in statistics alone. Um, so uh, it's often been said that the data scientist is a bit of a unicorn, which is that there's no one person who's an expert uh, on all of the different uh, areas or domains that compose data science. Um, and as such, uh, it's worthy to say that uh, it may be more appropriate to think of a data scientist in terms of different types of roles, that some people have different emphasis uh, uh, than others. And I can um, recommend a, a free book by O'Reilly, which is available online, called Analyzing the Analyzers. And so O'Reilly, which is a well-known uh, technology publisher, uh, actually used analytics to analyze data scientists and so they actually performed cluster analysis and identified these four particular roles uh, which are the data developer, data researcher, data creative and the data business person and that they each have uh, different skill sets. So the data business person of course has more domain experience in their particular area so maybe customer or marketing analytics and uh, a little less of a mix of the other areas. Whereas the data researcher has a great deal of uh, statistical and mathematical knowledge. And uh, uh, the data creative uh, may be a, a blend of all of these, whereas a data developer uh, may have more uh, programming and uh, machine learning expertise, for instance. So uh, this is, a, I think, a good uh, taxonomy of the different types of data scientists and I, th I think it's a good way to, uh, to address uh, the topic because data scientists uh, is such a broad field that not everyone can uh, have a full expertise in all the different areas. So what are the technologies that are used? So I get asked this quite a lot. 
um, which is people want to understand uh, what are the tools that data scientists use, uh, particularly those people who want to become a data scientist themselves. Uh, and it's interesting to note that another survey done by O'Reilly, also publicly available, uh, called the uh, uh, 2014 Data Science Salary Survey, they also performed analysis of uh, uh, the data scientists in terms of the number of tools they used. And so you can see here that the majority of data scientists used uh, between six and ten different tools. And uh, in terms of what those tools were, uh, here's, here's what, how they broke it down. And uh, I will uh, mention as a caveat that uh, we, we have mixed in here operating systems, uh, uh, databases or data sources, programming environments, and uh, uh, actual packaged commercial analytics tools. So it's, it's a broad combination of, of different uh, technologies. So, uh, uh, but we, we do see here, for instance, that R uh, and Python are, are quite heavily used uh, they're both open source and free. Uh, SAS, of course, is, is, is very heavily used. Um, and, uh, you know, we see different programming languages also here. And a lot of the Hadoop types of um, uh, uh, Apache Hadoop ecosystem tools being used. And in order to give a little bit more detail, um, the Data Science Salary Survey also broke down five clusters of tools that were being used by data scientists. I think this is quite interesting uh, because it points out that um, data scientists are working in different uh, technical domains and commercial domains. So cluster one out, out of the five clusters uh, could be called the enterprise uh, computing cluster, which is uh, the people in this environment are heavily using Windows uh, and commercial tools to conduct analytics. So SPSS, which is IBM and SAS, uh, the Oracle database system uh, are being heavily used by commercial computing data analytics experts. At, whereas cluster two here um, is what we might call the Hadoop uh, big data analytics experts. So this, these are tools that are uh, associated with the Apache Hadoop project broadly. Um, so we have not only the, the Hadoop platform, but we have um, also Spark, Pig, Manhout, which are various uh, tools that are used to, to conduct data analysis on the Hadoop platform. Um, so they're also more typically using a Unix or Linux-based uh, uh, environment. Um, so, so uh, and may also be using, for instance, cloud-based uh, resources such as Amazon Web Services. Uh, so the remaining three clusters then, we have uh, cluster three, which are the open source data scientists. And um, it, it's difficult to generalize, but I might say that a lot of uh, students coming out of uh, program and data analytics uh, might fall into this category because uh, it's very easy to learn and train on free open source tools. So we see Python and R here, uh, and uh, we could uh, anticipate that these people have, have been using uh, freely available open source tools. Um, whereas we have down here, cluster four, and this is what I would call the web-based analytics um, cluster. And these people are more tied to the, using the Mac platform to develop web-based um, tools and solutions for data analysis. Uh, so using JavaScript, Ruby, and D3, which are, which are uh, 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 scripting uh, approaches to doing, uh, for instance, visualization for D3 and data analysis. Um, so, so these people um, are typically deploying uh, web-based solutions uh, to do intensive data analysis and visualization. And so cluster five then are uh, the long-bearded uh, old men of uh, data analysis, uh, which are people who are, have probably been using Unix or uh, C++ and Perl and C for, for uh, 30 years or more and are quite happy to continue using those tools. Uh, so that's more the old school uh, uh, approach to data analysis. So I think that's, uh, uh, in my view, it gives a lot of insight into the uh, technologies that are being used uh, by uh, uh, data scientists and, and, and data analytics experts. So, um, well, we've, we've quickly come towards the end here. And so I tried to uh, put things into a framework to address the technology 
the, the processes, which is the data analysis itself, and, and the people, which is the expertise involved. And so we did that by looking at, the, at cloud computing as a, a stack uh, of, of services. Uh, we talked about data analytics in terms of the, to try to simplify and demystify the methods that were used to conduct data analysis. Uh, we talked about data scientists themselves in terms of how they fall into uh, some key categories and also in terms of the particular tools that they use and apply. Uh, and, I, and I think that um, I hope in a very short span of time uh, combines uh, big data, uh, cloud computing, and data analytics, data science, which is all of which are substantial topics, but I hope may uh, help you to link them together in your mind and get started, uh, whether that be uh, in commercial consulting or in training. So um, with that, I think I'll, I'll bring things to, to a close. I really appreciate your time and patience, and I'd be happy uh, if people are interested to address any questions that might arise. Scott, thanks. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I'm getting question. So what training roles would you recommend for a person who wants to make a career in big data who has no programming skills? Um, so, yeah, well, was, I think that's a, that's a good question. So. Uh, when we identified from the O'Reilly research that there are different um, categories of, of data scientists, uh, the data business person probably uh, is that category that has the fewest uh, programming skills. And increasingly, there is a need for people uh, uh, who lack uh, deep technical skills but can uh, assist in framing uh, uh, framing business problems and translating them to some of the more technical people on, on large teams uh, uh, in order to conduct data analysis. So I um, have seen uh, that uh, recruiters in particular um, do respond to those who've gone through and certified on Coursera data science or data analytics uh, courses. Um, so uh, one way to get started would be to pursue um, a, a track of uh, getting a data science certificate off of Coursera. So John Hopkins University, for instance, offers, I believe, uh, eight or ten uh, courses that are linked together, um, which you can certify, which gives you a data science certificate. Um, I, I myself have a certificate in data analytics from Informs, and Informs is the uh, uh, largest global organization for analytics professionals, and they have a training booklet and program um, and that does not require programming skills to, to get that uh, certification. It's, it's a bit more focused on statistical analysis and machine learning techniques. Uh, probably I would say you can't totally avoid programming, so I would suggest um, getting, uh, perhaps pursuing one tool such as uh, uh, R or SAS um, and pursuing uh, some knowledge, basic knowledge of that tool. And I think you might find uh, just getting your feet wet with R or SAS that the it, it, they're very accessible tools that, um, that you can very quickly find tutorials on the web uh, where you can copy a script and instantiate it and perform your own data analysis. So it may be useful to choose one tool and to draw try to develop a little bit of um, understanding in that particular tool. Hmm. So feel free to link with me on LinkedIn and uh, you can see some other presentations on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.